This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to another edition of the In Focus podcast. I'm your host G Sampath. Is it okay for the union government to impose limits on how much a state government can borrow? or does a state government have an quote unquote enforceable right to raise its own borrowing limits this question raised by the kerala government has been referred to a constitution bench by the supreme court now the key question that the supreme court wants a five judge bench to decide is the following whether fiscal decentralization is an integral aspect of indian federalism and if so are central regulations fixing borrowing limits on states a violation of the principle of federalism in fact in its suit filed before the supreme court kerala has also accused the union government of imposing arbitrary borrowing limits due to which the kerala government is on the verge of bankruptcy unable to pay salaries unable to pay pensions and unable to fulfill its various financial commitments In this episode of In Focus we explore this issue in some detail looking at the federalism aspect of course but also other questions flagged by the Supreme Court have the center's restrictions resulted in a differential treatment to Kerala compared to other states and are the center's restrictions in conflict with the RBI's designated role as the nation's quote unquote public debt manager To explain this issue in detail we have with us Kaliswaram Raj Supreme Court advocate based in Delhi Raj welcome to Infocus and thank you so much for joining us Thank you Sambhat thank you So Raj to start with I was wondering if you can explain uh, how did the union government get this power to impose restrictions on a state government's borrowings I mean one understands that some of some amendments were made to the fiscal responsibility and budget management act frbm act 2003 in 2018 so what were these amendments and were the state governments consulted on this legislative move which has had obviously a great consequences for all the states yes uh, uh, somewhere the fact of the matter is that the fiscal federalism understand until we assimilate it as a constitutional imperative we won't be perhaps able to understand the scheme of the fundamental law uh, governing the realm i would say the union's power to impose restrictions on the state borrowing that in itself is a contested issue it essentially stems out from articles 292 and 293 of the constitution as you suggested in the question the enactment was there in 2003 in fact it was designed in 2000 itself by the erstwhile vajpayee uh, regime and brought into the form of a central enactment in the year 2003 which we call generally as the fiscal responsibility and budget management frbm act uh, the act as it stood originally didn't meddle with the 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 fiscal autonomy of the state in any substantial way that is very important to understand if the problems arose the problems of intrusion arose only by way of amendments and especially by way of 2018 amendment prior to that there were amendments which again in 2004 2012 2015 there were amendments but those amendments were essentially related to the extension of the of the deadline for eliminating the revenue deficit therefore for that reason uh, those amendments did not substantially affect the fiscal autonomy of the states whereas in 2018 they came with a drastic amendment this drastic in the sense that by way of this enactment parliamentary enactment what the stand, what the parliament has actually done is to is to meddle with the constitutional design of things fundamentally what well, i will just explain that what they have said is by virtue of section 4 of this basic enactment of the act of 2003 which was amended 
the center was given to given the power to ensure that the aggregate debt of the center and the state does not exceed 60% of the gdp by the financial year 2024-2025. So instead of the sender's uh, uh, expenditure or the sender's power to borrow, it contained, it rather took in the state's power to borrow as well. This is again a scheme of the constitution which made a clear distinction between the borrowing by the government of India on the one hand and borrowing by the state uh, on the other hand, by virtue of Articles 292 and 293, uh, read with the corresponding entries in the union list and the state list. Therefore, this 2018 amendment is at the root of the problem, which is now being agitated before the Supreme Court. Right. I mean, uh, very uh, important points here, uh, Raj. Thank you so much for that. On the one hand, of course, you pointed out this is a contested issue whether the state can impose restriction and the, se the second uh, point you made is that uh, this whole uh, issue started with the amendment the drastic amendment made in 2018 which unlike the previous amendments made to the FRBM Act actually meddles with the constitutional design so are you uh, suggesting that the constitutional design was far more uh, integral in terms of uh, a federalistic approach to state finances with the center not having any kind of a role to impose limits is that what the articles you refer to 292 293 actually say i mean what ex exactly does article 293 say which i think kerala has also said that it gives it an enforceable right to you know decide how much it can borrow is that can you explain a little bit about these two articles you refer to yes i will try, try to do that mr sambat see the constitution envisages a kind of separation of power in the matter of borrowing as well. This scheme is very important. And you will find the uh, uh, seven schedule listing. Senders public that is shown as item number 35 in list one. And the state's uh, public debt is given in item number 43 in list two. It's significant to note that it does not fall under the concurrent list, in which case the sender would have had some kind of upper hand by way of a parliamentary legislation, which if repugnant with the state legislature will be prevailing over, over the state legislature. Such a scenario is absent. Therefore, though our constitution in general has a, 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 a centralist uh, trait, we generally try to make a balancing act. The constitution also does that to a great extent. There are certain situations where the sender's power is rather unique. For example, uh, see, uh, emergency, emergency power, the uh, breaking down of the, of the constitution in the states, the sender can act. But the states cannot, uh, doesn't have a reciprocal power in those kind of situations. President's rule, you cannot impose state's rule over the center. These are some kind of unilateralism is inbuilt in the constitution. Nevertheless, in the kind of fiscal matters, the constitution envisages the certain kind of uh, autonomy for the, for the states. And once this autonomy is meddled with, that can uh, create a kind of uh, gross imbalance of you know, the mechanisms or the institutions under the constitution. This is the problem. Therefore, what I would suggest is, uh, when the uh, center is acting unilaterally, see the amendment in 2018, is, take, take it again for consideration. The center has, by way of amendment to section 4.2, and especially the proviso to that clause, the center has rather allowed itself to breach the fiscal limits prescribed by the very same enactment in certain contingencies like, contingencies like say, natural calamity, war, national security uh, requirements, etc., etc. See, as far as the state is concerned, the state also is having a legislation. For, for, for example, take the Kerala, Kerala's case. Kerala also enacted a, 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 a legislation in the year 2003, called Kerala's Fiscal Responsibility Act 2003, which is constitutionally sound and well-supported. 
But when the sender amends the enactment in such a way that nullifies the state enactment, uh, resulting in a situation where the state is precluded from exercising its fiscal autonomy guaranteed by the constitution. Therefore, it results in a situation where the state is asked to, to uh, request for the mercy of the center for the purpose of borrowing, which is not coming, falling under the constitutional scheme of things. Right. I mean, that is uh, very uh, well explained indeed. Thank you so much, Raj. I mean, it is fairly clear, I think, that, the, that there is a mandated separation of powers when it comes to fiscal matters. But uh, but nonetheless, the center did go and make this amendment in 2018. So how come uh, was it? How was it able to do this? Was, was it not challenged uh, before the Supreme Court or any other court? This kind of uh, clearly it's in violation of uh, what the constitution and mandate is. How come, has there been any challenge at all before this particular suit in 2024? In fact, this uh, particular case, that is original suit number one, but 2024, is the first of its kind. And therefore, it is it is quite unprecedented and unique. Uh, anyway, since the matter is now referred to the constitution bench, uh, a, a quietus will have to be given to this legal issue, constitutional issue, which is also a political issue actually. You know, this is uh, is having an impact in the in the day-to-day -day functioning of uh, the government, the the process of governance as such, and this will have to be rather decided by the constitution bench uh, based on the uh, the instant reference. Right. So one of the key terms uh, which get uh, bandied about when we discuss this particular issue is something called the NBCs or the net borrowing ceiling. So in this case, uh, there seems to be some kind of, there have been suggestions that Kerala has been getting uh, some kind of a differential treatment compared to other states. I mean, we don't see other states complaining as much as Kerala. So what exactly is this NBC? How is it uh, working in, in actual, actual terms and is Kerala getting differential treatment? from the center obviously it's not a bjp government we know that uh, there, is, there is a proven there are a lot of evidence that bjp state government was a non-bjp state government there is a very different treatment not least in the way the governors uh, end up uh, operating but in this case uh, coming to this particular case w what are your thoughts in fact the kind of differential treatment or uh, kind of you know discrimination is writ large in the process and kerala is not uh, uh, the only state which has suffered it. Even during the deliberation in the Supreme Court, during the uh, very same litigation, the center has uh, taken a stand that they have received 14 requests, one for 14 requests uh, by nine states altogether and the, uh, for, the, for permission to, for borrowal. And the center has declined all the 14 requests. This was uh, the stand taken by the union. In the, very, in the present case. So which will indicate that Kerala is not the only state which has suffered the discrimination. Uh, Kerala, of course, Kerala may have a better, uh, rather, you know, uh, case before the Supreme Court in the sense that because of the uh, uh, economic specificities of the Kerala, when the borrower is interfered with, since it's a state which uh, doesn't have much to produce and depends much on tourism and IT and other knowledge industries and all, and without any material production as such in the conventional sense, uh, the, the interdiction against the borrower may be affecting the state more. But uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the center has converted a, a parliamentary legislation which was supposed to govern the union's activities for transparent fiscal uh, management and equitable and distribution of country's wealth uh, as a means to harass a particular state chosen by the center dip, uh, based on some other politi the, the temporal political considerations. That is the unfortunate part of it. Right. I mean, that is very well put indeed. I mean, the center has converted a parliamentary legislation, which is a means for its own, uh, you know, uh, right way of financial management to, into a tool for harassing uh, state governments. I mean, now these restrictions which the union government is putting on state governments in, in Kerala in this instance, aren't they in conflict with the designated role of the Reserve Bank of India? as the nation's quote unquote public debt manager. These are exactly the words of the Supreme Court when it referred this case to a constitution bench. 
so so what are your uh, thoughts on this uh, raj uh, that's a significant question uh, sambath see uh, there are fourth brand institutions uh, envisaged by the by the constitution in the realm of fiscal relations not only the reserve bank of india but even the controller and auditor general see the controller and auditor general again is is uh, designed as a as an independent fourth branch uh, 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 machinery to uh, work as an umpire in such kind of situations it is not healthy for a quasi federal system to perpetuate the kind of disputes uh, between the center and the states on a permanent basis which in itself is a big hindrance to the process of governance therefore the constitution has uh, designed the fourth branch institutions and several statutory institutions as well the the controller and auditor general which is uh, uh, designed by articles 148 and 149 of the constitution uh, uh, can work not only with respect to the accounts of the union and the states but even with respect to the authority or body provided it is support pro that, that, that kind of examination is supported by a law made by the parliament there is a sea of difference between the the center central government itself doing these things and an independent body like the controller and auditor general doing such supervision so when a fourth branch institution with a, a, a kind of independence a, a sense of independence is doing it the space for complaint will be extremely low as history of india has already demonstrated whereas when the center executive directly does this just see the letters issued by the center executive which is the subject matter of the supreme court litigation in one of the letter the that is the letter dated 27/3/2023 what the center has done is the the ceiling was limited based on the uh, assessed gromet, uh, gross state domestic product gsdp for the financial year uh, which came to uh, inr 32442 crores so this borrowing was uh, capacity was limited unilaterally by the central government which is something which may not be generally done by the controller and auditor general which will uh, expectedly act in a non partisan manner this is the big difference and therefore i have suggested in your question the parliamentary legislation has attenuated the role for the agencies like the reserve bank of india and or the controller and auditor general right uh, speaking of uh, the, the 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 borrowing cap uh, and the figure which the government has uh, come up with i mean you are absolutely right when I mean, the executive overreach uh, is, is it's, it's not just limited to one domain as you have seen in this fourth branch institution i think it's a very good perspective to have how their domain has also been encroached upon uh, by the executive in this extremely unitary dimension of governance we are seeing now the supreme court while referring this case to the constitution bench uh, refused kerala's uh, plea for an interim order to lift you know the net borrowing ceiling so that it could borrow an additional 26000 crores on an immediate basis to fulfill its various you know pension payments and salary payment requirements and while uh, rejecting kerala's request for an interim order to lift this ceiling the supreme court justified it by saying that as the case uh, case stands today quote and quote the balance of convenience lay in favor of the union government you know what what, what is the meaning of this balance of convenience I mean, as a lay person uh, can you please I, mean, I don't understand what it means yeah, in fact uh, sambath i have my own reservations about the about the way in which the triple test has been applied by the supreme court uh, for rejecting the interim relief claimed by the by the by the state of kerala of course the reference to the constitution triple test yes triple test we conventionally use in legal parlance when an interim relief is claimed uh, one will have to show three things number one 
he or she has the prima facie case. An existence of a strong prima facie case or a strong existence of a prima facie case. Number two, the irreparable injury. That is to say, if the uh, prayer is granted, uh, who will be suffering an irreparable injury? And if the prayer is refused, who will be suffering the, suffering the uh, irreparable injury? That will be a, another test, the second test. The third one, as you suggested, is the balance of convenience. That again has some nexus with the second test and balance of convenience would mean that who will be in a better position uh, to suffer the order which is uh, expected, which is said to be passed by the court. If an order is granted, who has, you know, the, in, uh, when you balance the rights, interest, prejudice, etc., of the contesting parties, whether grant of relief will be more justified or whether refusal of the relief will be more justified is the is what is implied by the term balance of convenience. But my reservation would be that this conventional, uh, you know, the triple test, uh, which is essentially a common law practice, which uh, is normally used uh, mm -hmm. in the civil suits and all, uh, in common law uh, parlance, may not be very uh, as such applicable when it is a constitutional issue. To uh, elaborate it, if something is, is on the face of it uh, unconstitutional or anti-constitutional, then you may not, uh, that will have to uh, be given some kind of primacy and not this kind of balance of convenience in irreparable injury, etc. This is a case where, on the face of it, the sender was acting as against the, the intent and content of Articles 292 and 293, which envisage the separation of power between the sender and the states. Having uh, uh, made out that case, then uh, going straight away to this uh, conventional principle as if it is a kind of civil dispute or a boundary dispute, no, was not very, very, very much appropriate according to my view on that. The court, on the other hand, should have uh, uh, rather focused on the, the prima facie constitutionality of the, of the amendment and, and of the imbued actions. And that, based on that, the court should have, in fact, granted the relief instead of declining it. The granting of relief would only mean that a state-owned corporation in the state with all the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, sureties and other securities and other kind of fiscal safeguards will be borrowing certain money, which is, you know, the, uh, which is in the urgent requirement list of the state, which is an imperative to have uh, immediately, in which case the state would have had its, you know, the, the usual requirements met. Instead of that, uh, by taking note of the fact that a portion of amount was consented to be paid. Uh, that is rupees uh, 13,608 crores was uh, consented to be paid by the sender. And uh, there, uh, there was only a again a requirement for some more amount. And that was rather postponed by the, by the uh, referral court uh, on the ground of reference till it is uh, decided by the uh, uh, five judge bench no further borrower will be allowed according to the interim order. That part of it I am not very happy with. Right. I mean, it does seem a bit uh, bizarre. I mean, on the one hand, uh, there is a recognition that this is a constitutional issue uh, which needs to be uh, decided with, with, uh, with sort of a grave thinking on this whole, uh, first, whole, whole framework of uh, you know, separation of powers and who has powers to do impose what restriction. And then suddenly it becomes some kind of a civil suit kind of a scenario where you're talking about balance of convenience. Uh, it's strange indeed. Now, coming to one more granular aspect of this uh, case, uh, Raj, one bone of contention is that as per the current regulations, uh, borrowings by state-owned enterprises uh, are also deducted from the NBC or the net uh, borrowing ceiling. And Kerala has opposed this uh, kind of a practice saying that it is unfair 
So is it unfair or as the centre would like to argue, is it reasonable given that state governments we know do tend to, I mean all governments do tend to finance their fiscal deficit numbers by off budget or borrowing which they don't need to show in their uh, budgetary calculations. So uh, what do you think, is it like unfair? It is, it is unfair and to a great extent it is unreasonable and even illegal I would say. The reason is that, see, the, the uh, borrowing ceiling, the imposition of a net borrowing ceiling on an, on a, an authority, which, you know, is, is not the government asset. In the Kerala's case, it is a, it is an enterprise is called, you know, KIFB, which may be a public, you know, uh, supported uh, uh, institution. But to say, but to impose a net borrowing ceiling, uh, on such an, uh, an authority, uh, such an establishment, in the matter of you know the extra budget uh, borrowing, would hamper, uh, uh, would meddle with the day-to-day uh, -day administration of the of the state. It will have direct repercussion because see, a legal entity will have to be recognized as such, and that the transactions by that entity will be normally governed by the rules of the market not by the uh, dictations uh, given by the center from time to time it can it is it, it is something which is very artificial and unnatural so if when an organization like kifb in kerala for example well, what is, organization is this can you there is, a, the there, is a, there is a there is a particular organization which is governed which, uh, which is envisaged by the by the state government so those for that organization uh, which is made for the purpose of borrowing money by offering bonds. Normally, we call it as masala bonds in the in the common parlance. So bonds bonds are sold by the the uh, organization which is designed by the state government, and you know with due security and uh, you know, uh, adequate mortgage and all of things. This this independent state-owned organizations or uh, which is doing the borrowing. When that borrower is interfered with, you know, by the central government, which is totally a stranger as far as the transactions are concerned, you know, that has uh, uh, resulted in some kind of lawlessness uh, in the realm of transactions and the commercial transactions. That is highly unwarranted. Uh, that is not contemplated. And the present enactment is, is uh, you know, is bad in law in as much as it's tries to, to make such intrusions into normal business transactions with a public law element. Right, intruding into normal business uh, transactions with a public law element and the two public law which is uh, now uh, being referred to a constitutional bench. One last question Raj before I let you go, we are running out of time. Now the central government has claimed that uh, Kerala's financial problems are due to its own fiscal mismanagement dating back to the last 20 years. It's not like something, you know, uh, they are on the verge of, verge of bankruptcy overnight. It's been building up and this has nothing to do with the center's, uh, you know, ceilings on borrowings. If Kerala had managed its finances responsibly, they wouldn't be in this kind of a situation today. Now, this is the center's argument which, is, which it has made in the Supreme Court. Now, without legislative tools like the amended let us say frbm act and these nbcs what options does the union government really have when faced with financial profligacy or financial irresponsibility uh, from different states i'm not saying kerala has been financially irresponsible but theoretically speaking if any state we know that state governments do tend to be uh, you know uh, push the envelope in terms of uh, fiscal responsibility is concerned so when they do uh, act in this manner uh, should the union government uh, intervene and uh, if it were to intervene, uh, what kind of options or should the union government not intervene at all? Yes. The, the straight answer to your question, Sampati, is uh, that we have the controller and auditor them. That's the very, the very purpose of Articles 148 and 149, which is a constitutional body, which is supposed to be an independent body unless the center of course uh, doesn't include with its functioning as well which also you know we 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 find some negative signals in recent times unfortunately that apart the controller and auditor general is supposed to look into such things and a, a scenario where 
the sender is making such accusations against the state and the states in turn making the uh, allegation of uh, of fiscal uh, profligacy as against the center that is something disturbing in fact uh, the uh, state government of kerala has in the instant case pointed out certain reports um, uh, not even pointed out they relied on uh, the moody's report uh, uh, of 2023 the imf report of 2023 to indicate failure on the part of the center to regulate public debt. It, uh, so in such a scenario, these allegations and counter allegations will not take us anywhere. The, instead of the problem essentially uh, um, happens because whatever things the controller and auditor general is, uh, is supposed to do in a, an objective and impartial way in the best interest of the state and the center is now being done unilaterally by the executive at the center. This is precisely the, the kind of uh, change and that has been uh, attempted to be made into the whole thing. That is something unfortunate. That It shows essentially a kind of aggrandizing uh, executive at the center as it happens in other realms of the polity. Like I if to draw an immediate analogy, this is somewhat similar to the situation where the center is using the gubernatorial offices at the state to hinder, uh, to meddle with the, the, the governance in the state. In the rather, in, this is a kind of uh, yeah, fiscal parallel for that. And the center is doing the same thing with the financial transactions of the uh, states, especially the states which are governed by the uh, opposition parties. That is the unfortunate part of it. And therefore, I think the uh, problem can be resolved uh, uh, only by way of an assertive judiciary, which takes a, a kind of you know uh, uh, constitutional posture in the matter and uh, decide it uh, uh, with a, a sense of uh, uh, federalism uh, and uh, the other principles attached to the constitutional morality. Right. I mean, I mean, thank you so much uh, for that, Raj. I mean, I think it's fairly uh, clear from what you're saying that uh, the, the center is basically seems to have uh, taken over a job, a function that was being performed by the controller and auditor general of India, the one of the fourth uh, um, branch institutions, as you as you characterized it, and uh, it, this kind of unilateral uh, reach by the executive, you know, into this uh, controller and auditor general's domain and uh, has resulted uh, seems to have resulted in this uh, current impasse over borrowings and ceilings on borrowings and hopefully uh, as you said the judiciary will uh, take a reasonable and fair call on this issue when it uh, comes up before the constitution bunch uh, once again thank you so much it was an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you raj thank you so much thank you thank you in focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues in the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by The Hindu. We'll see you soon.